Um, perhaps you could start just by telling us a bit about some of the opportunities for big traditional financial institutions like JP Morgan to work together with fintechs um, to help improve um, open finance broadly. Yeah, well, thanks for having me and I'm happy to speak to it. So ultimately, when you think about the payment ecosystem and all of the participants, it's not a a solo game in terms of one institution working on their own versus another. It is a collaborative um, effort and really in the partnership space. So when you look at open banking and the next advent of open finance, it really is working with the likes of fintechs and also specialists in this area to really power one, the adoption, but standards, frameworks and ensuring it's delivering what it's intended to do. So that may be via regulatory means that we're able to do A, B, C, D in a given jurisdiction, but ultimately when you look at the partnerships, it's really to see what can we collectively do to enable or unlock the best use cases dependent on the target market that you're you know, engaging with. And JP Morgan, we very much look at our partnerships uh, and to see how we can deliver best outcomes both for our clients and their end users if applicable. Um, are you able to share examples where, where, where JP Morgan has done that or where you've seen other companies do that? Yeah, so in, in terms of our positioning, we've definitely worked with different fintechs in the space of potentially looking at payment processing, accessing wider you know, collective intelligence and, and seeing how we work in, in, in that space. So it, it really depends on the focus area that, that you're in. I think you can appreciate it, an institution as large as JP Morgan. Uh, we've had some public investments in the fintech space and then some partnerships that, that we work with to deliver solutions. And, and if you look at that, it really is multifold in different areas in terms of geographical reach, but also the products offering we're trying to serve. So when you think of JP Morgan and payments, it really is any payment anywhere. And that means we have to partner with different institutions, including fintechs to deliver uh, on that statement. So that, that's where you look at it. And then you look wider across outside of JP Morgan and you, and you look at different participants. Um, what WISE is doing with SWIFT is very interesting in the payment space. That Then you have other institutions that are looking at how can you bring, you know, digital kind of technologies outside of the fiat currencies that we're currently offering, but in the fintech space with traditional institutions. So it really is quite varied, but it's the power of the partnership is the key message. And again, it can cross, um, it can span across multiple areas in both open banking, open finance and traditional payments. Um, are you able to speak to any of the successes that you've seen in, in this? So it, it's a good question. <laughs> and I'm just going to speak on a, on a personal level here. If you look at and I'm moving back in time pre-open banking. If you look at mobile money adoption, particularly in Africa, it, it was a way of inclusion for multiple people to get access to, the, to be able to spend their money and be able to receive money. And that was done before open banking. And it was really because of the power of mobile phones. Then you look at, okay, what's advent of that in Europe or further afield? And you look at, well, what did e-money bring? and multiple players came out of that space. Some of the big FinTech names that you know are now global brands because of the e-money revolution. And that's not just a single geography. You're really looking at the likes of APAC in that space. You're looking at Europe, Middle East, Africa, and also LATAM. So it's been a global phenomenon. So I think it's safe to say that we do have examples of where technology is driving good. It's also driving financial inclusion, but it's been across multiple players. It's not a single institution driving those advancements. What ethical considerations do people need to think about and what are the risks in terms of bias and uh, generally transparency when people are working with AI on open finance? Yeah, no, and this is a key topic and, and it's also one that people rightfully have front and foremost in their mind. Ultimately, you have to work within the bounds of trust and safety. One, one what are you currently, I'm just going to talk about a banking institution at the moment. One, what are you currently adhering to from a regulatory level, but also from a transparent nature? How are you setting up your product stack to deliver good outcomes for your direct customers or the wider ecosystem? And I'm talking about payments here, but when you look at that, it's how are you driving those insights from the initial data set that are informing that? So how are you collecting your intelligence, a collective intelligence or data that could be across your full institution? Are there siloed views of how you're applying models or deploy deploying AI versus different um, lines of business? So is there a collective 
approach in the institution regarding the safe use of data, the bounds of which the data can be used, but also a governance and a rigor to it to ensure that one, there's oversight of it, i.e. you have a governance model to make sure that the people that are in charge of actually running these models, that they're you know, being sense checked. And then also there is the regulatory bounds of it. What are regulators thinking? How can you consume the data? How are you meant to deliver those outcomes and also the transparency as to if end users are having their data consumed, what is it being used for? Is it being used to enhance product offerings? Is it being used to enhance customer experience? Is it enabling greater pro uh, payments processing speed? Is it delivering fraud protections? And those are kind of key components that everyone should have in the back of their mind. If we deploy this uh, technology, and for some institutions it is early days, so they're still learning as they go, but those are core tenants of their business today. How are you deploying products to market? What technology are you using? And what information is informing that deployment and oversight of the product to ensure good outcomes. And what are the risks in terms of bias and, and generalizations made by AI? And what are some of the wor potential worst case scenarios if you don't get that right? Yeah, and, and this is a key component. So when you look at bias, it's the unintended consequences. How did it get built into the model in the first place or the technology that's been deployed? So first and foremost, it's back to how are you generating that pool of intelligence or data set to inform the technology you're deploying to either make predictive um, outcomes or to bring further insights. So LLM, lar large language model. So it's one, how are you informing it? Once you have that data set defined, what does that look like in terms of potential bias? Do you have a certain cohort of individuals that are you know, excluded? from a product set, e.g. credit, lending, giving opening bank accounts, so on and so forth. And from there, why is, it, why is that outcome possible in the first instance? Is it because of it's been over-engineered, i.e. it's been overly constrained, that you know, there's been an interpretation of a regulatory standard or an industry standard that has driven to this part, particularly maybe financial crime concerns or sanction concerns? Or is it that it's a first-time deployment and the entity is learning as they go. So therefore they have to take back what they learned and ensure they take back the learnings and recalibrate as they go to remove those biases were identified. And in, in practical terms, like what can, what can a company that's using AI do to make sure that that bias doesn't creep into the system? Yeah, so th there's a couple of things there. One is a collective thought process around the models not necessarily an individual running the model or the, con the constraints or the framework of the model on their own. So like good old fashioned maker checker, but in a, in a more technological sense. So who is really informing what you're looking for? Then the next one is from a governance oversight standpoint, there are shifts. There's new technologies coming all the time. We see it and I'm sure in a year's time we'll be talking about something else, not just generative AI. And then you also have the regulatory landscape developing. So it's always making sure what was built for today is actually fit for purpose for tomorrow. So it's not just about actually saying, how do I check from the outset, but how do I make sure we develop good practices to ensure the health of the model going forward? So it's continuously iterating on it. It's not just build once and leave it and, and park, park it. Thank you very much, Karen. I really appreciate you going into, into such detail.